Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest is Gage. Gage, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Zeke. Oh, it's great having you. Gage, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I've grown up in Alabama my whole life. I'm a key and air technician, and that's where I go out and service air conditioners during the summer, especially during the winter. That's where there's a a lot of people need heat during the winter, so I go out. That's my big time. Besides summer, when it gets real hot, Um, I'm an avid hunter. I've grown up in the woods. I've fished all my life. Every single member of my family has either been a farmer or done something in the technical field. My father was a welder. My uncle is an electrician. And I'm a HVAC technician, as I said. And I've been doing that for about two, three years now. Well, I should be three years come February. And I, I've just always enjoyed being in the woods and fishing. Just anything somebody growing up in Alabama would enjoy doing. When you were growing up, what were your thoughts on things that go bump in the night like Sasquatch? Did you believe in them? Well, Vic, I never really gave it much thought because the way I looked at it at the time was, well, it's just a bunch of Hollywood monster stuff. You know, I I, I grew up watching Dracula and Frankenstein and things like that. I never gave it much thought, really. Honestly, I didn't believe in all that. Well, that wouldn't make you any different from a lot of people. When you had your dogman encounter, did it solidify the idea that Sasquatch are also real for you? Yes, sir, it did, because after I got to thinking about it, I thought, well, if this thing exists, why can't a Bigfoot? Because this thing was flesh and blood, so why can't the Sasquatch Bigfoot people are seeing be real as well? That makes good sense. If you think about it, if dogmen are real, what else is real? When was the first time you heard the Appalachian Dog Man? I actually had heard about it growing up. I just heard, like, basically campfire stories, you know, things that older people would tell to scared children and stuff. So, you know, hear it at, I was a Boy Scout at one time, and they tell us stories about a dog man, you know, to scare us. And that, that's really all I can remember ever being told and hearing about it. I've never heard anything on the news or anything. You know. I just never really heard anything about it besides in a few times. Well, it goes without saying most people don't because it doesn't exactly get thrown around the way Sasquatch or Bigfoot does. How much research did you put into Dogmen after having your encounter? I'd say I put a great deal into it trying to understand what I saw and what happened to me. I started looking things up, Googling things, so... I actually bought a book. I can't remember. It's actually on a shelf here in my bedroom, but I'm in a living room right now. But I want to say the name of the book was Lycanthropy, but I can't. It was an older book, and I can't remember the author's name to save my life. But I read that book, and I read some other books, and like I said, did my own research. And I was just trying to figure out, you know, what I saw, what had happened to me, to help me cope with this. Well, that wouldn't make you any different than most eyewitnesses. After you have an experience like that, most people do try and get as much info on dogmen as they can. So that's pretty much to be expected. You think your dad might have had a dogman encounter of his own. Why do you think that? Well, I say that because when I was about seven or eight years old, I was at my granddaddy's farm. Me and him were actually in the kitchen. We were just talking and everything. The best I remember was actually talking about frog gigging. And I remember my daddy came into the house because he was off that particular day and he wanted to go fishing because he hadn't been fishing in a while and he just loved to fish. And he came in the house all real scared and he said, Daddy, I want to talk to you alone. He said, something happened. He said, I just got to talk to you. So him and my daddy went to his room. They didn't have the door quite closed. So me being a little bit nosy thing that it was, I went and tried to eavesdrop on him and they ended up catching me and they shooed me away and shut the door and went farther into the room where I couldn't hear him. And I went and talked to my granddaddy today, and I asked him about 
why am I decking inside a house scared that day? And he told me, he said, son, he said, your daddy had an experience similar to what you had. And I said, really? He said, yes, son, he did. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, your daddy was out on the boat. And he said he was fishing on the riverbank. I said, well, what part of the river was he on? And he said he was down there right in the south side. He said, do you know that part we went fishing that time when you were about 12 years old? And we nearly run up on that log over in the water. I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, it was right in that area. And he said, your daddy was fishing. He heard something in the bush. And he said that he really didn't think nothing about it. It was probably a deer until this thing walked out of the tree line and was looking at him. And I asked Randy, I said, well, what was it? He said, well, son, it was a booger. I said, a booger? He said, yes, son. He said, it was a booger. And I asked him, I said, well, Papa, what did it look like? And he said, well, he said, your daddy said that it was black. It was real tall. He said, it was bigger than him. He said it was between seven and eight feet tall from what I remember your daddy telling me. And he said that your daddy could smell it from where he was at. And he said it just had this real bad smell. He said it kind of smelled like trash that had been sitting out in the heat. And he said that it just looked at him and it watched him. And your daddy told me that he had forgot his gun in his truck. And he said he was scared to death to even come back on the bank. He said even though he was going to have to go down the river, he was still going to have to get the boat out of the water. And your daddy said that when he finally did make it down the river, that he thought this thing had actually followed him down the river along the bank just where he couldn't see it. And he said when he got there where his truck was in the trailer, he said that he just kind of stayed out there for another 15 to 20 minutes and when he was satisfied that there wasn't nothing out there he got his boat up on the trailer and he said he got out of there and about that time you know he came flying back home and you know the rest I'm surprised your dad held that info from you for all those years I am too uh, of course at the time that he said what he did to me I was a little bit older but I don't think he quite wanted to share his encounter with me because I don't believe he just wanted to scare me with it a dad's first responsibility is to protect his son or his daughter, so I guess he saw that as just shaking you up unnecessarily. When you were young, you used to be afraid of werewolves. One day your dad had something strange to say about that. What did he tell you? Well, the reason I was scared of werewolves is because me and my daddy had watched this movie when I was younger, and the name of the movie is Silver Bullet, and it's actually based on a book by Stephen King called Cycle of the Werewolf. And what scared me was when the werewolf comes up out of the bottom of this shack and gets this man and kills him. And and I couldn't watch that movie from then on. I couldn't even see a picture of anything with a werewolf. And as I got older, there was movies that came out and had a werewolf in it. And I just point out, because I eventually got over my fear. And because I... Told myself, well, you know, things ain't real, so it's just Hollywood movie magic, so I'm scared for nothing. I'd point out things like, you know, that makeup, you know, that he has on, it's, you know, starting to run, or things like that, just Hollywood mistakes. My daddy told me one day, he said, son, he said, you ain't don't think it's too funny when you run up on something like that. And he said, you come nose to nose with it and toe to toe. He said, you know, I don't think it's funny. Yeah, that's pretty eerie. I'm sure he was thinking back on his encounter when he was telling you that. And you talk about that movie, Silver Bullet. I never will forget seeing that when I was younger and when that werewolf jumped out through the floor in that greenhouse and grabbed that guy. I almost had a self-deprecating moment on the spot. That really shook me up, too. Growing up, how much time did you spend in the woods and what did you do out there? Well, just being another kid growing up in Alabama, I spent my time in the woods playing you know, running around, and you know, I went with my daddy and uncle hunting, my granddaddy hunting, fished, and to get to one of our particular fishing holes, you had to walk in on foot. You couldn't go in on an uh, ATV or truck or anything. You had to go in on foot, and to this day, in my mind, that's the best fishing hole here around. I don't frequent it as much as what I used to, but... I've went a couple times, me and a bunch of my friends that I've grown up with will go sometimes. But I, I just grew up in the woods playing. 
hunting, fishing, like I said, and just doing every day Alabama boy thing, I guess you'd say. Well, that sounds like a great way to grow up to me. Have you ever gone back to the place where you had your encounter? I went once. It was not too long after deer season had ended in, uh, I believe it was January. My uncle went with me. My girlfriend went with me. We went back. and When my uncle called me the morning that we went, he asked me, would I go back and show him where it happened? I told him, I said, no way. I said, there is no way that I'm going to go back. I, I told him, I said, uncle, I said, there is just no way. I said, you can't pay me to go. Well, my girlfriend, who I'm still happily with today, she encouraged me to go. She actually convinced me and coerced me into going. And we got there in the truck. And at first, I didn't even want to get out of the truck. I, I just remember telling my uncle, yep, this is the place. This is it. Yeah, this this is it. Uncle, I said, you know, can we, can we just get out here? My uncle wanted me to get out and show him a little bit more. And I told him, I said, I'm not getting out of the truck. And my girlfriend again, she got me out of the truck. And she has a way of calming me down. And she did it ever since we were in high school. And what she does, I played football and she was in the band. We were up to win the state championship football game. We have been state champions. And we had the game won, but the opposing team came back, made a touchdown, and they kicked a the field goal, and they beat us by a field goal. And obviously we're in shoulder pass, shoulder pass, go down, just about all the way down your back. And she just took her hand. She just rolled the back of my back on the lower part. And that's just what she's always done to help calm me down. It, it, it did a great deal, and I was able to get out. And we stayed for maybe 30 minutes back to that. I told my uncle, I said, I just got to go. I can't be here no more. We spent a good amount of time talking about your girlfriend in the pre-interview, and she definitely sounds like a keeper. I'm so impressed by the way she supported you through all of this. Oh, Vic, I, I, I'm truly blessed to have her in my life. and She's the light of my world. And Honestly, I don't know what I'd do without her. I believe I'd have honestly went crazy. The men in from the funny farm and the white lab coats would have came and got me, probably. Oh, I can understand that, especially considering the nature of that encounter you had. All right, Gage, please tell us about this encounter you had. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, well, my encounter... Initially, I told you it happened on the 3rd of November of 2015. Looking back now, it actually happened on the 4th. Now that I go back and think about it, it happened November 4th of 2015. So it's been right at a year. And I got out of school because I was going back to school, and I still am, to get a different degree so I can actually teach heating and air at the local high school or teach at the community college somewhere or after I start my own business up I can teach some of the younger guys some things that I've learned some just useful hints and everything and you know just teach them a little bit different what you get taught in college about doing it because the way they don't teach the way the book does but experience trumps a book every time and I got out of school about three o'clock actually I think it was about 302 when I got out and that morning before I went to school, I had called my uncle, who owns a farm, and I asked him would it be all right if I went hunting on his land. Now, his farm is between 82 to 85 acres, but four miles down the road from his farm, he owns another piece of property that came with the farm. Initially, it had one green field already on it, but my uncle and my granddaddy and me had actually went and cleared out three other places for green fields. So now there are four. My uncle's an electrician. And he has two trucks. He has a 97 Ford F-350. And the other one is Chevy S-10. I don't remember the year exactly. But I want to say it's between a 99 and a 2004 model, I want to say. And I told him, I said, if you're leaving me the S-10 and you take the F-350 to work with you when you go out on your call today, I said, I'll just take the S10, I'll hook the little trailer up to it, and I'll put the ATV four-wheeler up on there. And I said, I'll just use that. And he told me, said, well, son, that'll be fine. When I got to his house that afternoon, I got to his house about 4, between 4, 24, 30. And I noticed that the F350 was there, but the 
S10 was not. Well, I went and knocked on his door and rang his doorbell. Nobody came, so I took my key and unlocked it, and he had left me a note on the kitchen table. And he told me to go ahead and take the F-350. It'd be better for the trail and the road going up to a piece of property that was four miles away, going up on the dirt road to the green fields. Well, I went ahead, hooked up the trailer, put the four-wheeler on there out of the barn, and I just made my way on down there. Now, the piece of property that's four miles from his farm is actually adjacent to the main road. It actually comes off the main road. And the main road at one time was just a two-way road going towards the town. And there was another one on the other side, another two-lane going down the other way. And about... I'd say about 20 yards from what I remember when we dug the poles. There is a cable gate. Now, I'm not talking about our cable gate like you buy from Lowe's or somewhere. What we did, we took a 10-foot steel pipe, cut it in half, took post hole diggers, and dug, I believe, either four feet into the ground or five feet, and poured concrete in there and set the poles down in there. Well, and the local power company, Alabama Power was getting rid of some telephone cable, and we got that. We fashioned it to make a kind of like a block, kind of like a a blockade, I guess you'd say. Well, just a gate, a cable, and fix it where it can be undone, laid down, put back up. Now, we did that because if anybody tries to go up there in a car and don't stop, number one, it's going to take your car all the pieces. Number three, it might just flip the car because these poles ain't going nowhere. <sighs> When I got to the poles and everything, I had just enough room to get the truck up there with the trailer just where it's off the main road. And this road is dirt. And it goes from being pretty wide up there going pretty narrow. The F-350 is a pretty big truck, both long ways and in width. And one thing I forgot to mention, that this F-350 is not a crew cab. It is actually an extended cab. And it's a four-speed straight shift, man. And... So I got out, unlocked the gate, went up the dirt road. I didn't lock it back. And my uncle and me had actually cut it into the woodland, a place where you could turn the truck around. That way, if there was an emergency, you didn't have to deal with backing up and trying to back up with a trailer. Because I don't know if anyone listening has ever tried to back up with a trailer, but it's one of the hardest things to do because you have that ball pivot on the back, and it's just one of the hardest things to do. So it's just easier to turn around. That way you can zip and go. Well, when it turned the truck around, unloaded the four wheeler. Then I just made my way to my deer stand. On my deer stand, I was hunting on Greenfield number three. And it was one of the ones we'd actually done that we'd made. And the deer stand in particular has a ladder on it that you would climb. Well, I got up in my deer stand. One thing I forgot to mention was that this was during bow season. And I climbed my stand. I was sitting there. It was pretty warm because in Alabama, when it gets around the last part of October, the first part of November, it's pretty warm during the day. But when it gets night and in the morning, it's real cold. It can drop to about 50, 55, 60 degrees. It's just real cold in the mornings and at night. So I was just wearing a long sleeve camouflage shirt, pants, and boots. I had my face painted up, and I was wearing my ball cap. And, of course, I was wearing hunter orange, just in case there was anybody walking through who would try to kill me. They would think I was some kind of animal or something. That has happened before the people all over the United States getting shot by hunters because the hunter that got shot was not wearing orange. Well, honestly, I didn't think I was going to get anything. About five... 30, or a little before 5.30. This doe that weighed between, if I had to guess, 75 to 80 pounds, maybe a little over 80 pounds, walked out to the green field. Well, I drew my bow back and I hit her, and I saw at first I missed her because she kind of squatted down, and then she got up and ran, but I could tell I hit her because she was limping. There, it actually almost went completely through. Well, I climbed down and I followed the blood trail and I actually found her, but where she had went, she went down this ravine and this ravine 
actually has rocks on it. It's one of the hardest things to get down. And it's even hard to get back up. And the thing about it is, around it is the thickest woods that you've ever saw. And you can't get a four-wheeler in there. I've tried before. I never tore it up. Between it flexing on the rocks and just going over logs and everything. And there's holes. And I didn't want to take a chance. And I took that chance for it. And it was four-wheeler up. So what I did, got my rope out, got down there, took my air out, put it back in my quiver, got my rope, and I proceeded to drag my dough out. Well, I drug it back up these rocks. Of course, it took me longer to drag the dough up the rocks than it did me going down them the first time because I didn't have all that extra weight on me. Well, when I got to the top, I sat down next to my dough, and the sun was almost completely down. It was almost dark. Well, the woods were dark, but it, the sky was not completely dark yet. The sky was kind of a purplish, orange color. It was real pretty. And I remember actually saying, looking over at the deer, and saying, you gave me one of a challenge getting you up here. I just kind of laughed about it, kind of chuckled to myself. So I sat there a few more minutes, and of course it got darker, and I proceeded to drag it back to the four-wheeler, strapped her onto the front of it, and I made my way back to the truck. Well, when I pulled up alongside the truck, I got off, cut the four-wheeler off, and dropped the tailgate, put the deer in the back. I had the tarp with me, but I hadn't yet put the tarp on my deer. And I went and loaded my four-wheeler up, and when I got that loaded up, I got inside the truck, well, on the truck, when you open up the cab door, any of the doors on there, the light will come on, but when you close it, it'll go back off. So, I turned my headlamp on that I had, and I went rummaging through the glove box to find the tags, because I was going to go ahead and fill the tag out. The reason for that being is in Alabama, if you get caught with a deer that is not tagged, and you have not written one out, and it's not on the deer or at least have one written out and it be on your person, you will be fined and the game board will actually confiscate the deer. Well, I didn't want that to happen. I didn't want my deer taken, so I went ahead and filled it out. And it was getting cold. But if I had to guess, it was about 64, 66 degrees. I mean, it, that ain't too cold for being in Alabama, but when you go from being hot all summer, that gets pretty cold, so I cranked the truck. It was in first gear and had the parking brake on, which is really important detail. And I was filling out the tag and everything. When I got done, I turned the radio on just for a minute because I had brought with me some dinner. I had brought me a ham and turkey sandwich with lettuce and tomato, and I put a few slices of bacon on there, and I brought me a bag of chips and water. And I was eating it. It was real dark now, and of course the running lights on the truck were on, but you couldn't see nothing in front of me because, like I said, it's just running lights that don't shoot very far in the dark. And well, on the passenger side, I can't say, Vic, whether it was right next to the cab. I know for a fact it wasn't, didn't come from the front of the cab, but it was either right there at the back of the cab or towards the middle of the truck. I felt something. Very light speed, and I wouldn't have actually noticed it had I not been paying attention. And like I said, I had the radio on, but it was real low, and I could hear everything going around me just about. I was actually listening to a sports radio station talking about Alabama and all the football down here in Alabama. That's a big thing. The SEC teams are kind of like a religion for people around here. You, can, you watch your favorite team on Saturday, and you can pull for them, you hoop your heart, and all that good stuff because football. And I was listening to that. Like I said, I felt that. I got thinking about it. I just kind of cut my eyes over in front of me. And I noticed that some limbs were shaking. Well, not necessarily shaking, just kind of gently blowing with the wind. I just chalked it up as the wind blowing. Because if wind blows hard enough and you're in a stationary vehicle, you can actually kind of feel it shake a vehicle. And I just chalked it up as being the wind. Well, about that time when I thought that, I was nearly done with my sandwich, too. I felt the truck shake, dip in the back, and then it leveled out. When I say it leveled out, 
the back of the truck sits a few inches higher than the front for a reason. It sits higher in the back than it does from the front because when you put a load in the back of the truck, it levels it out. That way, nothing slides. Well, this thing levels it out, and my first thought was, what in the was that? And I thought, and when I say I thought, I, I don't mean I sat there and I seriously thought about this like a math equation. I mean, it was like a split second. And the first thing that came to mind was maybe a limb fell out of a tree, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, if it was a limb, it would just shift the truck and it wouldn't load it out. So my uncle on the back of his truck has a marine light, or spotlight, it's a marine light, as I call it, like he put on a boat. And it is angled at the truck bed. And inside there's a toggle switch, so I just flip the toggle switch. And thick in back of my uncle's truck, I saw the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. My first thought was it was a brown bear. And I got thinking about, like I said, again, split second. I thought to myself, well, it's a brown bear. Well, no, brown bears ain't around here. Well, it could be a honey bear. No, it ain't no honey black bear. Because they ain't that big. And besides, they're black. Well, I couldn't see the head. But I could see the body, and the body was like this, kind of a mix between a reddish brown color, is what I'd call it. It had real long arms, and a hand, like I necessarily call it a hand, Vic. It was kind of a cross between a paw and a hand. But the best thing I can kind of relate to is kind of like a raccoon hand, the way they look. Like I said, I didn't see the face, I could just see the body. And this thing was every bit of about seven foot in between 600 to 700, maybe even 800 pounds, Vic. I don't know. I mean, it would have been between that ballpark range, 600 to 800 pounds, to level that truck out in the back. And I actually believe it may have weighed it down more in the back than it should have the way it did. Well, I'd already cut my headlamp off, and I was eating in the dark. I forgot to mention that. And... I cut, like I said, the marine light off. And my first thought was, man, am I really seeing this? So I want to give a full disclaimer here and now. I was not drinking. I don't do any kind of mind-altering drugs at all. I'm completely against that. I will admit, I like to have a beer with my buddies every now and then, but I don't drink while I'm hunting. Like I said, I don't do mind altering drugs. And my first thought was, did I see that? And I thought, well, maybe, again, split second thinking, did I really just see that? And, you know, it could have just been wine playing tricks on me. I'm tired, so I cut the marine light back on. Vic, it had lowered its head, and it wasn't quite towards the back glass of the window, the back windshield. It wasn't quite there yet. It was still in the back of the truck, and it had, like I said, one hand on the deer except it was looking into the back of the truck. Well, its head reminded me of a German Shepherd. I actually have one, and his name is Riley. Beautiful dog. And the ears on this thing remind me of my dog's ears. And the whole facial feature reminded me of a German Shepherd. And I actually thought, that's a big dog. Well, I got to looking at it. When I saw it, I don't mean that I turned around. I saw this through the rear view mirror. That's why I didn't see the head at first. If I had turned around, I'm sure I would have saw everything. I saw the head, had a long beard muzzle, and it was just looking back at the light. I think it may have actually startled it that it came back on. Then he could have just stunned it, or I'm not even typically blind. Like when you're in the dark and somebody just comes up and cuts a light on it. You know, it kind of blinds you for a second. I think that might have been what actually happened. I think I actually did to it twice. Well, I cut the marine line back off. So at this time, I'm trying to cope with what I'm seeing. So I cut my headlamp back on. And I turn around. And I actually thought for a second that I could have been dreaming, so I just pinched myself. Well, it hurt, so I know I wasn't. I, I know I wasn't dreaming. I turned around, and Vic, I hit this thing dead in the face of my headlamp because it had put its face 
almost directly against the back windshield back glass of my uncle's truck. And I'll say this about my uncle's truck. The seat in it sit pretty high. And I'm a big guy. I'm 6'3", six, 6'3 three, six, three and a half. And I'm pretty muscular from playing football and baseball and track. And I still work out. I mean, I'm a pretty big guy. But the way I was sitting in the driver's seat, I was not laying down. The seat was straight up like I would be driving. But I kind of slumped down too. So the top of my head had not been above the seat. So I don't know when I flipped the marine light on that first time. I cut it back off whether it was trying to see me in there or not. I cut it back on. It still not got quite to the back glass yet, but I noticed that it, it kind of moved up. I could see it move, and I cut it back off, like I said. And I was trying to cope with what I was seeing. Well, I turned around, and Vic, when I turned around, I caught this thing dead in the face with my headlamp. And when I did, the people dilated. And almost simultaneously, when I caught it in the face, the people dilated. Its breath just fogged up the back glass, back windshield of my uncle's truck. Well, one thing that really stood out to me was his eyes. And the best compliment I could give this thing would be its eye color. If I had to describe its eyes, it would be a mix between a hazel and a brown color. Had it not been on this thing, I'd tell you it was the prettiest eyes I've ever saw. But, again, I was going through the time of living. But, again, it had all in it. And another thing I noticed on the muzzle, looked like it had a scar. Like it might have been in a fight with something. Or I don't know, just looked like scars going down the side. And, the nose on this thing reminded me just like my German Shepherd's, like a dog nose. And I could see its teeth. It was showing me its teeth. And one thing my German Shepherd would do when he's hungry, he'll kind of lick his chops. This thing did not do that. It just showed me its teeth. Well, this whole encounter while it was in the back of the truck, probably took no more than maybe three minutes or five minutes tops. I, I, I dare say five minutes because that'd be the lengthiest it could have been. Honestly, believe it was about three minutes. Well, at the time, I was not thinking straight shift manual. I was thinking get the out of here. Well, I just pressed the gas on the truck. And, of course, it revved the engine. When I did that, right as it idled back down, I, I'm not sure whether it was the engine or whether it was the thing in the back of the truck. But it sounded like, kind of like a, something guttural, kind of like a growl, I guess you'd say. And like I said, I'm not going to swear to it. That's what, that it came from the thing in the back of the truck. And I'm not going to say there's the truck itself, but I did hear something. And when I realized what I had done, I immediately took the parking brake off. And I started going. Well, I prematurely put the truck in the second gear, and I'm thankful I did not stall the truck. I believe it was a, the grace of God that I did not stall the truck. Anyways, I signed up I prematurely put the truck in the second gear. And when I did, the truck bucked. When the truck bucked, the thing fell down in the back of the truck and actually rolled off the back of the tailgate because I, because I did not put the tailgate back up. It was still down. Well, going, I, I, I went as fast as I could down the road. Well, it was actually a trail from where I was at first from the trail down the road. Well, like I said, the main road is adjacent to the dirt road where the gate is. And I knew for a fact I could not go down this road as fast as I could and make that turn because I knew if I tried to turn, the trailer on the back would start to turn. And I knew I'd flip. And I knew if I flip, one of two things is going to happen here. I'm going to be killed in a car wreck or I'm going to live. This thing is going to come down there with me. I'm going to have to deal with it. And I knew it was probably going to kill me. And another thing I forgot to mention, Vic, was that at the time, I was carrying 
pistol with me. I always carry a pistol wherever I go. And my pistol is a Kimber 1911 45 caliber. And this whole entire time, I never once thought about using my gun. Not at all. I did not. So, I put the truck in neutral. And I started to slow down. And in my rear view mirror, I looked. And I cut the marine light back on. And when I did, it illuminated the back. Plus, the trailer lights were on. And I could see this thing running on all fours. And I mean, at the time, I was trying to haul going down the road. Let me tell you something. This thing was hauling after me. I mean, it wanted the deer or it wanted me one. I mean, it, it was like a dog chasing a car. That's about like what it was. It was hauling. Well, I made the turn. I didn't even bother getting out to trying to lock the gate. I was not going to do that. There was just no way because one, it wouldn't even stop for me to lock the gate and it probably wouldn't even face it. It probably would just jumped over the gate. Well, I got back up to speed when people that drive straight shifts, manuals, know that when you go from neutral and you're rolling, you have to get your RPMs back up, be able to shift into any gear. And Vic, I got in the second gear, and this thing, I don't know if you've ever seen or anybody in the audience has ever watched the Sprinter run track, but when they run track, they start out real low. And it's a real smooth motion. It's real neat to watch. It go on YouTube and look it up if any of y'all hadn't seen it. But all in one motion, they come from being real low on all fours on a track. And they come up real smooth like. And what that does, it actually reduces wind pull on your drag. And you can actually cut through the wind better and run faster at the get go. Now that's what this thing did. Now, I was in second gear. And I was not paying attention to how fast I was going. I was directly looking at my RPMs. And this thing had caught up to me. And it was about at the middle of the truck bed on the driver's side. Like I said, this is a two-lane road. And nobody was on this road at the time. Because nobody really goes out that far. Long people go out there. Farmers, people have houses down through there. And people come back from town. Well, I put the truck up in the third gear, and, of course, the truck sped up, and this thing sped up with me. Well, as it was running next to me, it would look down the road, it looked at me, it looked down the road, it looked at me, and it repeated that process several times, and I remember thinking, I have one gear left besides reverse. And like I said, this was a four-speed manual truck, and... I knew I had one gear left, and I knew that if I couldn't have one this thing, I was probably going to be at dinner. It was probably going to say, screw the deer, I'm going to get the thing inside the truck. Well, I put the truck down in the fourth gear, and I sped up, and this thing still kept with me. And even with it in the back of the truck, I thought this, even as it was running alongside the truck, it was about maybe four feet running alongside the truck, maybe even five feet. It was close. If I had real long arms, long would I have, like a roll down the window and probably touch it. And I have no doubt in my mind that it could have broke through the glass either on the driver's side door or through the back glass, extracted me from the vehicle. There wouldn't have been a thing I could have done about it. And Like I said, I put it in fourth gear and this thing was keeping up with me and it would look down the road, look at me, look down the road, look at me. And if I had to guess, this went on for about a mile. And I'm not sure how fast I was going, but I believe that I might have been doing anywhere between 50 to 60 miles an hour. And my mistake was shifting too fast. That was my mistake. If I had not shifted as fast, I could have gained more speed and probably left it. But my mistake was I was trying to get the out of there, so I just shifted gears without really thinking about it. Well, I'm not sure whether it got tired or it just gave up, but it started slowing down, and I watched it in the 
rear view mirror just slowly to a stop and just look. And I went up over this hill and I never saw it after that. I couldn't see it. Well, I went flying back down to my uncle's house. And like I said, that brought there's four miles from my uncle's farm. And one of my thoughts racing through my mind was, this thing is going to cut through the woods somehow and it's going to flank me and it's going to get me when I get to my uncle's house. Well, my uncle's house, you can see it from the road. You can see the farm from the road. It's a dirt road. And I went flying down the dirt road. And I actually didn't even bother to park the truck in the carport. I just went and parked it in the middle of the field. And I got out of the truck hauling, <laughs> yelling bloody, bloody murder, yelling, help me, help me, uncle. Help me, help me. He come out of the house because he'd seen the headlights going down the road. He heard me blowing the horn and everything. And when I got almost to the house, he yelled, boy, what is the matter with you? What is all this ruckus about? And I got to him finally, and I caught my breath, and I told him, and he said that I stuttered, because there's a lot of this I actually did not remember until I talked to him and some other people from that night. And he said I was stuttering, and he said that these were my exact words that I, that I saw a werewolf. And I don't remember saying that, and I don't remember what happened next, but my uncle told me that he said that he just looked at me and just kind of laughed off and asked me if I'd been drinking. I told him, no, sir, I've not been drinking. And he just kind of said he laughed off and he all just chalked it up there with prank and he asked me where the deer was at. I told him the story. He asked me where the deer I said, I don't know where the deer's at. I said, I don't know if it's in the back of the truck or where it's at. I said, I don't give a I said, if that thing got the deer, I said, we can have it. I don't want it. I said, I just want to get out of here. So I got my keys and I got back in my car. Well, it's not actually my car. It was my girlfriend's car because my truck was actually in the shop being worked on at the time without a lady we were in me. And my girlfriend did not work this particular day, so she let me drive the car to school and drive down to my uncle's house. Well, I hauled butt home. And again, I had the fear that this thing was following me. So when I got home, I put the car in the garage and our garage is right next to the kitchen. So there's a door you can go into through the garage or through the kitchen and go into either one. And I was phoning with my keys after I shut the garage door and I, I just knew that this thing was going to come beating on the garage door trying to get in and kill me. Well, I finally unlocked the door. I was yelling for my girlfriend, yelled her name. She come out of our bedroom. She said, what are you yelling about at this time? And I told her, I said, baby, get in the bathroom. She said, what if I got to get in the bathroom for it? I told her, I said, get in the bathroom. She said, why do I get in the bathroom? And I told her, I called her name. I said, now, get in the bathroom. And looking back on it now, I've told her since then that I apologize for talking to her the way I did and yelling at her. But after I did that, I went immediately to my gun safe. I'm not going to say where my gun safe in my house is at. But I went to my gun safe and I got my daddy's pump shotgun he left me after he died. And I loaded it with buckshot. I loaded it full. And I posted up down the hallway so I could see this thing come in either through the front, the back, or through the garage in the kitchen. And I had actually fell asleep. And I did not have a nightmare at this time. I actually woke up to my girlfriend beating on the door Tell me to let her the blankety blank out of there. And so I let her out. So I locked her in there is what I did. And actually put a chair up against the doorknob so she couldn't get out. And she come out and she just let into me. She let me have it. She wanted to know why I locked her in there, why she had to go in there. And I told her, I said, baby, I had something happen to me in the woods. I said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I said, I don't really want to talk about it. And she was kind of braiding. She said, well, what happened to you to make you so scared? I told her, I said, I don't want to talk about it. And she knew that I was being serious. And she told me, she said, Gage, put the gun down. And I told her, I said, I'm not comfortable putting the gun down. She said, Gage, put the gun down. I just looked at it and then I kind of thought about it for a second. And I thought, well, nothing's happened now. I, I believe I'm safe. And at that moment, I felt this calm come over me that I was now safe, but I was still shook up. It, 
and I put the gun down, and she hugged me, and I kissed her, and she rubbed my back again. I took me a shower, and I went to bed. Now, when I went to bed, I did not sleep hardly at all that night. Every time I'd go to sleep, I'd see that thing's face in the back windshield where my headlamp caught it in the face. I'd see its eyes dilate, and I'd see the breath fog up the back windshield. And it was several weeks after that that we were actually laying in bed one day, and she likes to read, and I was fiddling my phone, and I was going through Facebook, and I actually was not looking at anything on Facebook. I was just scrolling, but in my mind, I was thinking about this, because the day prior, like I said, this happened several weeks after my encounter. She, the day before she asked me, she said, Hey, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. And I'd had a long day at work. She knew I was tired. She said, do you want to talk about what happened to you? And I told her, I said, baby, I don't want to talk about it right now. I'm not sure that I can. And I said, I'll tell you when I get ready. And she said, that's fine. She said, when you get ready, you can tell me. And I was thinking about what happened to me. And I was thinking about how I was going to tell her about her calling the men from the flame farm and the white coach to come get me. But I knew that there was no other way that I could just sugarcoat it. Well, I told her, I said, babe, I want to talk to you about what happened to me. And she said, okay. And I began my story just like I'm telling you about getting out of school and everything. And told her my uncles had hunting and killed my doe and then leading up to everything else that happened. At the beginning of the story, I'm sure she was just thinking, well, you probably just saw a bear. Let me tell you something, I've seen just about everything there are in these woods. I've seen black bear, which are honey bear, they call them honey bears down here in the south. And I've seen cougars, and contrary to popular belief, there are actually cougars in Alabama. Game wards won't admit it, but there are cougars in Alabama all over, especially around their down mobile. And they won't admit it because there's actually, I believe, an overpopulation. Because not just me, but there's other hunters that have seen one. I actually had one jump out in front of my truck one day while I was going to work. Well, as I got to telling her what happened, she went from listening to me. Of course, she was already listening. But she went from listening to me to being, I'd say, on the edge of her seat. When I got done, she just looked at me and she said, Baby, I, I had no idea you would went through that. And she said, I don't believe you're lying to me because... One, you just can't make something like that up. She said, the people in Hollywood that make these movies and everything, she said, they may be able to touch on it. She said, but there's just no way. You can't come up with something like that. You can't write this stuff. And again, she calmed me down. and I was not able to go back out to the woods for months after that. I didn't actually go back hunting until three weeks before deer season ended, but I did not go up back to my uncle's place. I actually went with a friend down to his hunting club in Titus, Alabama, and I'm actually a member there now. I had nightmares for a very long time, and the majority of the time, it was about seeing the face in the back glass, back rearview mirror, well, in the back windshield, excuse me, seeing that, I just see that and it'd wake me up. I'd, I'd wake up in a cold sweat. And then I had this one particular dream one time. I had it only one time. And the best I can describe it, it was a dream within a dream. What I mean by that is, in my dream, I was dreaming and I woke up from the dream only to find out that I was still dreaming then I actually woke up. Well, in the dream within the dream, I dreamed of the back glass again and the face in the back glass and in my dream I woke up and my girlfriend said Gage what's wrong and I turned and looked at her and it was that thing laying in bed next to me and about that time I really did wake up and I pinched myself just to make sure that I was awake and my girlfriend actually did wake up and she said baby what's wrong and I told her I said I just had a real bad dream she asked she said was it that thing in the back of the truck that night and I said yeah it was and we actually got up and went to the kitchen, ate a bowl of ice cream. 
I wasn't able to go back to sleep after that. But I laid there in bed with it. And after my encounter, I felt like I was in prison. And it, what I mean by that is, the best way I can describe it is if you've ever seen a mom or the people from France that act like they box themselves in or pull imaginary rope, it felt like an invisible glass prison that was around me because I felt like I was the only one that ever seen this thing. And after I started eventually doing my own research, like I said, I bought books, uh, talked to people. I actually talked to some friends of mine that I grew up with and that's been people that were friends of my friends. Others that had seen these things too. And there were six of them. Three of them said that they had heard things in the woods that they could not explain. They smelled things, but they didn't know what it was. They never physically saw them. The other three, two of them, had basically the same experience, and they saw basically what I did. It was tall, it had reddish brown fur, and one walked out into a green field, looked at my friend that was in the deer stand, just stared me down and walked off. The other one said that he saw something that was tall, big, red, brownish fur, but it stayed to the edge of the green field and seemed didn't pay any mind to him. And he said he, well, both of us said they sat in tree stand for hours and just didn't move. And they got out of there before it got dark and they could finally move. But the last one, who was a very good friend of mine, I trust him, said that he saw one one time while hunting. He didn't give me too many specifics because he didn't really want to talk about it. And I understand that. I mean, I really do. And he told me that it was a grayish silver color. And I actually called him today to make sure it was, I actually called all of them to make sure that it was okay for me to share this. Every single one of them said it was okay. And I asked this one friend in particular that he was close to it. He was actually pretty close. He was sitting in a shooting house and he saw it. And uh, it was during rifle season. And it was no more than I believe he said that if he had to guess, it was no more than 15 to 20 feet away from him. And I asked him, I said, well, can you remember any particular details? And he said, well, the fur on it was not long, but kind of a medium. But when it got towards the belly, it thinned out. Said, That's exactly how I can describe mine. He said, this thing was big and it looked like a bodybuilder. And he said it made Hulk Hogan or all sorts of nigger look, you know, like it would be wimp, you know. And he said the one thing that stuck out to him was one eye was actually put out. Well, he said put out, but he went on to later describe it. It was kind of a milky color. And the other one, he said, looked just black. He said it was just black eyes, like a doll's eye. And he said the other eye, like I said, was a milky color. He said he reckoned that it had just been put out or something had happened to it. He said it may have been born like that. He don't know. And after talking to them, I didn't feel so much alone anymore. I didn't feel isolated. But I still wanted to know what had happened to me. I, like I said, did my own research and everything. I prayed about Steve. I'm a religious man. I believe there is a God. I have an old saying that I've heard that I repeat to people. I would rather die believing there is a God and find out that there's not one than die not believing there's God and find out there is one. And I'm very religious, like I said, and I prayed about it, and I prayed about it. And in a way, I believe God has brought me to this point in my life to right now to be able to share my experience with other people. And the reason for that being, I believe, is to help spread the word that these things are real, they are out there, and they are not gentle giants or anything. These things will kill you. I can attest to that. And like I said, I prayed about it, and I prayed about it. Well, one day, I was scrolling through things about werewolves and the uh, dog man. I actually found a website, which is your website. 
I dog man encounters. And I started listening to them. I didn't listen in order. I just kind of skipped around. And after I got to listen, I listened to it for about four hours. But just in a row. Sat at my computer. And I thought to myself, golly, well, I'm not the only one. Like, this is not isolated like I had thought. Like, it's just in Alabama. This is happening all over the United States. Michigan, you know, Washington, Virginia, you know, all across Texas. You know, just happening all across. And it dawned on me, there has to be a lot of these things. And it's not just one thing moving around state to state. That's impossible. And me and my girlfriend actually listen to you when we can. And Listen to you in the car, truck in the morning, coming home, going somewhere. We'll just sit on the couch and listen to it, hook up the laptop to the speaker and everything. And we'll eat and listen to you, just about everything else. We, we thoroughly enjoy your show. And she actually encouraged me here about a week ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago, to actually contact you. And I told her, I said, well, you know, I, I don't know if I want to do that. She said, well, Gage. You know, he talks to hundreds of people every day. And she said, you know, it might just help you. She said, because, you know, you'd be talking to somebody that knows more about it, what you've done research on, somebody that has experience with mom, self, seeing And, you know, Vic's talked to a lot of people, hundreds a day probably. And he, he knows what he's talking about, Gage, and didn't get in contact with him well. As you know, I told you I sat at my computer for about an hour contemplating whether I wanted to tell you my story or not. Because like I told you, there's a difference for me between typing it and actually telling it to you. There, there's a difference in me and you both actually know from last night when we talked that I had to get pretty comfortable. And it, it did take me a while, but I'm more comfortable now. I've tried not to stutter or uh, take as many pauses that I've had to and Vic I just really appreciate everything you've helped help me with man I mean I really appreciate it brother well you know you're welcome I'm so glad your girlfriend encouraged you to reach out and contact me about this after having talked about that encounter last night and after talking about the encounter tonight how much has it helped you to get that out now? It feels like such a relief, like a cloud has been lifted above my head, like a giant pressure has just been taken off of my shoulders and my chest. I mean, I feel so much better about it. You know, I just, I don't know how to thank you, Vic. I, I really don't. The thanks that I get is when I talk with an eyewitness like you, and for example, I listened to all the trouble you had last night telling me about what had happened for the first time. And then I sit here and I listen to you talk about what happened tonight, the second time around. Being able to hear you do so much better tonight than you did last night when you are reliving that experience, that's all the thanks I need. That tells me right there that you're definitely getting better, and that's what this is all about. So, that's just great news in my opinion. How far do you live from where that encounter happened? I live, okay, I'm going to do some math here. I live about 15 miles from my uncle. So about 19 miles from where it happened. That's pretty far. Did anything ever happen after your encounter that led you to believe that it might have followed you home? No, sir, it did not um, for a while. I'd go out to my truck in the morning, that way I could go to school or go to work. But normally when I go to work, I wake up pretty early. I could be at my place of work pretty early. I could be there about 6 o'clock because we officially open at 7. And we have to be ready to go because we actually do have a schedule. Because people actually do schedule, you know, for heat and air technicians come out. And we have to be there by 6. And the 6 15 is actually the latest we can come in. And we officially open at 7, and that's when we start doing our wraps to go work and get people estimates on their heating and air condition, whatever problem they may be having, or even quoting them a price for getting a new one. When I go out more, especially when I got to work, I'm, I'm more cautious going out to my truck in the morning because, again, it's dark. 
and more cautious about it because I just kind of look around. And one thing I forgot to mention, I live in a neighborhood, but the neighborhood in the back is actually woodland. And the houses are not right next to each other. There's probably a good maybe 50 yards in between each house. I guess you'd say it's more of a rural kind of feeling neighborhood. But it's a nice neighborhood. Everybody gets along. Everything, everybody knows everybody. But uh, back behind the houses, like I said, there's woodland. And not too far after that, you can hear the highway, 759. You could hear it. I'm definitely cautious about that, but to answer your question, I've never felt like it's followed me home, because I believe if it did, I would have had more encounters than what I've had, and I've only had that one. And honestly, I believe it would have maybe messed with me, the toy with me a little bit at my own house, and I'm just thankful that didn't happen. Oh, I don't blame you. Yeah, if it would have followed you home, I'm sure you would have known about it. You would have at least had a funny feeling or something like that. When you flipped on the marine light in the bed of that truck, did it seem to bother the dog man? You talked about you thought it might have blinded it, but did it seem to bother it? Well, like I told you, when I first saw it, I was not turned around. I was actually looking in the rear view mirror, and I could not see the head. But I know from personal experience, when my girlfriend come into the bedroom or something, I'm actually awake. She'll flip on the bathroom light. That sometimes it'll blind me, or, you know, just when somebody comes into a room, cuts the light on, it may be daylight coming in through the window. You know, it'll still blind you. And I know that if this thing has regular eyeballs like a human does or anything else, that it probably stunned it, maybe blinded it the first time. I don't know about the second time. I, I feel confident that it did that second time, but there's just something twice in a row like that. I knew that would blind me. I've had it happen to me. But um, I believe that it did blind it. Again, I did not see the head when this happened. I did not see the head until after I cut the marine light on the second time and it had lowered its head look into the back windshield and like I said it wasn't quite against the glass it was making its way there it was just kind of looking in well considering the fact these things have a hair triggered temper if it would have made it angry you would have known about it so we don't have to guess about that which one of its physical features disturbed you most it, its eyes it, it they were the color that I said they were mixed between a hazel and a brown but it, the look it was giving me, it showed me his teeth, it, it just gave me this, you know, look, I guess, the best way I can describe it, look, I'm going to kill you, look, I guess, uh, or your dinner, look. And I believe I wouldn't have snapped out of it as quick as I did if he, I, I don't know the sex, I say he, because I mean, down south we call things he all the time, but uh, I don't believe I was snapped out of it had the thing not twitched its eyebrow. I wouldn't, I, that's one thing I forgot to mention, it twitched its eyebrow and that's when I tried to get out of there, press the gas and obviously it didn't move parking brake zone. But I could not tell the sex of it. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to know. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I've broke Western Stallions before in my life. And females are the hardest ones to do from my personal experience, my family's personal experience, and breaking horses and everything. So if it was female, I wouldn't want to know about it. But if it was male, I still don't want to know about it. But I'll give it this. That was a pretty ballsy move getting up in the back of the truck and looking into the back glass. Oh, I'd say it was. Yeah, they don't seem to fear much of anything, if anything at all, so I'm not surprised it did that. How would you describe its arms? Its arms were long, like real long arms, and it reminds me of kind of like my own arms. So when I play baseball, baseball players, you want real long muscles, which you want like real lean, long muscles. And the body of this thing, a bit like kind of like a bear and ripped. Like I said, they'd make Hulk Hogan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, look puny. But the arms 
arms were real long. I couldn't tell because it was squatted down in the back of the truck. It was not stand up. It was squatted down. And the arms were real long. But again, I could not tell in proportion to it standing up. And on the elbows, it seemed to be more fur kind of hung down right there. It was not patchy or anything like it had the veins or anything. It was not. It was just all there. The hair was all there. And towards the center of the elbow where you'd bend your arm, the hair was kind of thinned out right there. Like I said, the hand on it, the tall hand. Reminds me of what the raccoon looks like with the claws, hand, wet wings. That's what it reminds me of. It had to be a sight to see. How long were its claws? I'm not sure. If I had to guess, maybe two, maybe three inches long. Maybe. I don't know. But the one thing I noticed, the nails on it, they weren't like black, kind of like a dog's claws would be. And they weren't clear either. They were kind of a yellowish color, kind of a dirty looking color, kind of like when you have a uh, I had athletes who at one time played football and one of my toenails had actually got infected and it could turn kind of a yellowish brown color and it, it was nasty. But that's what it reminds me of. About two, two and a half, three inches long and it was kind of like the brownish yellow color that your toenail can kind of turn when it's infected. That's the color that it reminds me of. It sounds like they're more than long enough to do some serious damage. Can you go into the woods now without a gun? I don't like to. <laughs> like I told you, I carry my 45 with me everywhere I go, except while I'm inside the house. I've stepped outside into the woods for back behind my house without a gun. I don't like to. Oh, I can understand that now that you know they're out there. How jumpy are you in the woods now, even with a weapon? Well, Vic, it's like I told you, during my whole encounter, I had my forty five with me. But at no point did I think to use it. And I'm not sure that if, even if I had my daddy's pump or the, my forty five or a rifle with me, or let alone my bow, that if I walked up on one of these things or it walked up on me, I'm not sure... If I could pull the trigger or not, if I could defend myself, I'm not even sure that if I did shoot one of these things, that it wouldn't even face it. No, I'm not even sure if it would face it. If I might pull my 45 out, put three rounds in the chest, it might not even face it. Like, I don't know. As far as being comfortable, it kind of gives me a security, but in a way it's kind of like a false sense of security because I know what these things can do. Well, when you consider how many times these things have been shot without any desirable effect, that makes sense. You're wise to not be all that sure about how effective a gun's going to be against one. Do you think all dogmen should be destroyed? Well, Vic, honestly, I've never thought about that. I can't say that I wish they it all be destroyed. I can't say that because they're one of God's creatures and I have no right to go and wage a mass genocide on all of them. I, I have no right to do that. So to answer your question, no, I don't think they should all be destroyed. I don't. I just wish there were fewer numbers of them. <laughs> when you have an experience like the one you had, when you have such a strong fear reaction, anger normally accompanies that. Maybe not at the time of the experience, but normally not all that long after you have that experience. There's a phase you normally go through where you have anger. You're angry because this thing took away your ability to enjoy the woods you used to. It took away your ability to do a lot of things you used to like doing. Your grandpa knew a farmer who he thinks was killed by a dog man. What did he tell you about that? Well, it wasn't too long after I finally opened up to my granddaddy about my encounter. And the reason it took me so long is because my granddaddy is one of these types of men. He doesn't fool around, beat around the bush. I'm the same way, Vic. 
I finally opened up to him and he told me, he said, son, that is what we call boogers. And he said, that is the reason that your grandmama and I and your mom and your daddy always told you and everybody else, people in the South always tell their children, don't go in the woods at night because the booger man and get you. I can attest to that, that that is very, very true. But he told me, he said, son, I won't tell you a story. And he said, I did not see it. He said, but I believe the man that I knew that my family knew was killed by one. And at this point, I was kind of in shock. I was like, really? And he proceeded to tell me this story. And he told it like this. There was a farmer that was a neighbor of my granddaddy's. And when I say neighbor, I don't mean right next to the farm. I'm talking about miles down the road. That's what you'd be considered back then, a neighbor for a farmer. And they hadn't seen this particular farmer, neither my grandparents' parents or well, my granddaddy's parents, excuse me, or any of the other farmers hadn't seen him come in town lately. Well, they all got together because they thought he might be sick and decided to go down to his farm see if they could help him. And my granddaddy said as they all drove up, they were driving old Ford pickups and Chevy pickups. Somebody was actually, he told me, in a hunchback sedan and pulled up at his house and he said, it just looked like a regular farm, like nothing was going on. And he said it did not happen until they got out of the vehicle that they could smell something. Now, this man was a dairy farmer. He had goats and he had sheep. He also had chickens and pigs. But my granddad told me that they just smelled this real horrible smell, like something had died. And my granddad told me they had not seen this man in town for three or four days. And it was at the end of the three or four days that they decided to go look for him at his house, see if he was sick or see if he was okay. And he said that they all spread out between one another, about eight, nine foot in between them. They were all walked in a line going down the pasture where the smell was coming from. And they said that when they got there, that his sheep had been slaughtered. And they found the farmer in the middle, or just about in the middle of the pasture towards the barn and facing the direction of the barn. And he was laying on his back. And he had gashes in his back. And my granddaddy said that his daddy blocked him from seeing it. But my granddaddy said being a little squirt that I was, he jumped from behind his daddy and the men in front of his daddy and him had rolled the farmer over and said that he had just been mutilated, that there were pieces of flesh missing like something ate on him and said that his throat had been, what he said, eat out like something that took a bite out of his throat. And my granddaddy described the body to me. He said that he'd been laying in the sun for a while so it started to go ahead and dry up and start to rot. And he said that I believe it's called rigor mortis that already set in where the body had went stiff. And he said the man's shotgun was laying close to his body and there was one spent shell. And he said whatever it was had to have been big, had claws, and didn't mind a load of buckshot. And he told me then, he said that when him and his daddy got home, his daddy took him to the barn and told him, he said, son, he said, don't you tell your mama or your sisters about what you saw. He said, because the booger got, I can't, my granddad said that he can't remember the farmer's last name, but he knew that his name was William. And his dad said, my granddad's dad called him Toby. So I'm not going to say my granddad's name, but my granddad's nickname to his dad was Toby. And he said, Toby. Don't you tell your sisters or your mother what you saw because the bugger man had got Willie. And he said, if I hear you say anything about it to anyone, I will tan your hide. And well, eventually, obviously, a police report had to be filed. The body had to be collected. And my granddaddy told me the best he remembered that the sheriff and coroner in the paper had 
actually reported that it was a bear attack, and but they didn't mention all the sheep had been killed. In the papers, he said oh, it said only a few of the sheep and the farmer had been killed by a bear, and that they were out looking for a bear at that time. And my granddad told me, he said, I knew it wasn't no bear. He said, because a bear, he didn't believe would be that brutal. It just, just wouldn't have done something that brutal, that, 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 that gory. That's typical. They tried covering it up like that. Can you imagine going out that way? That'd be horrible. Well, Zeke, it's like I told you, when I was flying down that dirt road, and I had to make that turn, I knew one of two things was about to happen. If I didn't slow down, I was going to flip the truck, and I was either going to be killed, or I was going to flip and have a wreck, be hurt. This thing was going to come down there and deal with me, and I was going to be by myself. And I have no doubt it would have killed me. Well, I'm so glad you made it out of that situation in one piece. People you've spoken with about dogmen in your area seem to think dogmen only come out in the fall. Why is that? Well, I actually thought this too until our conversation the other night. The reason we thought that, and I say we, I think I hadn't discussed it with any of the others yet, that we think that it may have only come out during particular times of the year towards the end of fall, the winter, and the spring, but it wasn't seen during the summer was because maybe it was hibernating, maybe they migrated, or maybe it was just too hot to come out during the day with all that fur. We really didn't know, so it was really just uh, chalked up the theories about what it could be. And the one I tended to lean towards the most was that maybe they migrated up north to where it'd be a little bit cooler. So that's why there were more accounts up in the north than the north the south. Well, it's not just you who have that idea. There are a lot of people who have that idea for some reason or the other. Yeah, they come out in the scorching heat of summer. They come out in the deathly cold temps of winter. Even in nasty snowstorms. So there is no rhyme nor reason to when they're around. They're around all the time. You say you've learned to keep calm when you've had scary experiences. Do you think that helped you get through your encounter in one piece? Yes, sir, I did. And to the audience, I'd like to iterate on what they just said. In scary experiences, when I played football, I played the position of wide receiver and tight end. I was giving the ball a run a lot. Well, I had to run into people that were trying to knock my head off and try to run 100 yards downfield and make a touchdown. Well, it's scary, and I don't care what any quarterback, running back, tight end, wide receiver tells you. If they have, tell you, they have never been scared to run a football, they are either line or they've never ran a football in their life. But let me tell you something, it's scary when somebody is coming at you that's bigger than you and or just like running at you in general, they come up and they just rock you, just rock your world when they hit you and tap you. It, it's scary. But I learned from playing football to keep calm and what I do, I do these breathing techniques, some of what the military does. It's where you breathe in, you hold it for a couple of seconds, you let it back out, do the same thing again, lowers your heart rate. That's how I learned to do that, but when my counter happened, I did not think twice about doing that. I, I didn't even do it. My, my, my heart rate, I'm sure, was through the roof, and I'm sure my adrenaline was pumped, trust me, it, it was. And my, my, my breath, I don't remember, but if I had to guess, my breath was probably ragged when I caught that thing in the face with my light on my head and it was probably real quick like <laughs> like that if I guess I don't remember what what my breath was like I, I don't remember but I have learned to keep calm in situations like I said it all spawns from playing football in that type of situation and I just take the situation as it is and I just deal with it that way but when I had my encounter I did not know how to deal with it I just do get that out. Oh yeah, anyone would have been really shaken up by that experience. I don't care who you are. So that's only natural. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Gage. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yes, Vic, I do. I want to tell the audience, be careful out there that these things are real. 
and they do exist and they are dangerous. And I also like to say to anybody that is listening to the show that was like me that wasn't sure about coming on, I encourage you, I really do, to come on and talk to Vic about your encounter. He will sit down and he's very, very patient. He was very, very patient with me. He was understanding about a lot of stuff that I had to do in between our calls. We actually had several calls and one night due to some things that I had to do. And he was very patient about it. He's always been very courteous with me. I urge you to talk to him. I promise you that if you do, you'll feel better. And I promise you another thing, that Vic is not going to think you're crazy. He will not because he knows these things are real. He's not out here to make money or anything. He's here to help people. Well, thanks for the good words, and thanks so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate you and your time. Like I told you before in the show, I can't tell you how happy I am to hear that this has helped you. That's such good news. Well, have a great night, okay? You too, Vic. Good night. Thank you. Bye. (laughs) 